We really appreciate you showing up, dedicating an hour of your Friday morning to learning and hearing from a very admirable entrepreneur that we're very fortunate to have with us today. Um, so I just want to encourage everyone to, if you can, make sure you're muted during the event. If you have any questions at all, we are we will be reserving time towards the end of the event for Q&A. So you can enter your questions in the chat at any point and by the end of the event, we will uh, get to those questions. I will be asking them on your behalf. So before we dive in and welcome Sashi to share her story, I just wanna take a second to introduce myself and the Zip Launchpad. So my name's Jenny Amaranini. I'm the Director of Social Innovation at the Zip Launchpad. I know some of you on the Zoom today are involved in the Zip Launchpad program and fully aware of what it is. And then there's some of you who may have be hearing about the Zip Launchpad for the first time. So what is the Zip Launchpad? The Zip Launchpad is an on-campus business incubator at San Diego State University. So we help passionate problem solvers uh, launch companies. So if you have an idea or a solution to a problem and you want to launch a company, we will surround you with the support, the guidance, and the resources that you need to turn your idea into an operational company. And currently we have about 30 uh, startups in our program. We offer so many amazing resources to the students, staff and faculty who are involved in our program. It includes $10,000 in funding, access to a prototyping lab. We'll even pay uh, undergraduate students to intern for your company. So those are just a couple of the dozens of resources that you get access to in our company in uh, the Zip Launchpad. So now that you're aware of that, we can go ahead and introduce Sashi. We're really, really lucky to have Sashi with us today. Sashi is the founder and CEO of Tea Drops, which creates bagless loose leaf teas shedding about 15% less weight waste than traditional tea bag packaging. So since launching in 2015, tea drops can now be found in over 1500 retailers across the country. Another unique aspect about tea drops is that it is a female founded and led company. Sashi has raised over 7 million in funding to date and more than half of its investors are women. The company also operates a female forward supply chain and employs primarily women. And lastly, with every order of tea drops, uh, tea drops funds a year of clean water for someone in need. And to date, they have funded clean water for nearly 170,000 people. So we're thrilled to have you with us here today, Sashi. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. It's a privilege to hear about your story. And uh, I welcome you to take the floor from here and uh, dive right in. Well, thanks, Jenny. Thanks for the introduction and great to meet everyone. Um, again, thanks for taking the time. Um, I wanna make this as you know interactive as possible. If you have questions, um, please feel free to leave them in the chat box. Um, if I don't get it to it right away, I will make sure that we circle back when we have enough time for Q&A. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share. I put together just a little background deck on us. Um, if I can figure out Zoom, I'm usually using Google Meets, but give me a second. Yeah, there's that share screen icon. And yeah, okay. See it. And um, if you see, like, please ignore all my tabs. I crazy person with um, a billion tabs open. All right, can you guys see this? Cool. Okay, great. Um, so I, I'm going to go ahead and just kind of walk you through the beginnings of tea drops. Also, walk you through what is what what is a tea drop. 
Um, yeah. And so you guys can kind of hear the backstory and hear some of the lessons I've learned along the way so far in my entrepreneurial journey. Um, first, I'm going to go ahead and share a little bit about our company. I don't know how, many, how much you guys know, um, but I'll go ahead and do our little intro video. My name is Sashi Chandran. I'm founder and CEO of Tea Drops. We make an assortment of bagless dissolvable teas. We call them bath bombs, except they're actual loose leaf teas that dissolve in your cup. Our mission is to create magical tea moments that connect you to what's important, connection to oneself and connection to others. I personally come from a very tea-centric household. My mom is Chinese and my dad is from Sri Lanka. And I grew up loving the benefits of loose leaf tea in that it's more aromatic, it's more rich, it's more flavorful. I tried to always make loose leaf tea at my work desk and realized that it's a very cumbersome process. It takes anywhere from three to seven minutes to actually steep tea depending on the tea variety. And so that kind of sent me on a journey of experimenting with different tea blends and varieties in my own apartment kitchen. We would work from 6 a.m. all the way to midnight. It was just a magical time of, of working really, really hard, but also knowing that I was creating something that was of value and that people were connected to. Tea drops are the only bagless, dissolvable loose leaf teas. We are fair trade, we're organic, we're kosher certified. We ethically source our teas all over the world. We ensure that all tea estate workers are paid a fair, livable wage. We're really proud of Tea Drops to be woman founded, woman led, and woman operated. And here we just want to make a very simple, but high quality loose leaf tea experience that you can enjoy anytime, anywhere, whether you're on the go or you're in a more formal tea party setting, that this is a tea that's for everyone. So that is a little bit, oh, it's really playing. Um, that's a little bit about our brand and I'm going to expand on that, um, in the coming slides. So, you know, my journey with tea drops actually really starts with my parents' story. Um, my mom is Chinese. My dad's from Sri Lanka. My dad was actually born on a tea estate in Sri Lanka, which I got to visit a few years ago. So this is Dairy Clare estate. Um, on the left, you see, this is my dad's actual birth certificate that I actually pulled from the tea estate when I, when I was visiting a few years ago. And he didn't tell me this until a few years ago that he was actually born on a tea estate. And then when you realize that you realize how many, um, that nothing is by accident. You know, I fell in love with tea culture. There's this whole, um, points of connection that tie me back to tea culture, tea estates. Um, and my dad being a really important part of that story and my journey. Same with my mom. My mom's Chinese. Um, my mom came to this country when she was eight years old. This is her family. And she grew up in the restaurant business, um, also came from a heavy tea culture. Um, and then my parents met at UCLA in the 60s and they got married. And so that fusion, the cultural fusion um, merged at that point. And that is what I remember growing up with is a huge influence of tea culture and um, just there's a certain emotional connection I think that comes with tea drinking, especially when it's when it's um, amongst family and extended to family affairs and events. So um, you know you see a picture of my grandma, my Chinese grandma, and then um, my grandma, my dad's side, where whenever we would go to their house, he was always served. And so um, that played on with you know growing up and my mom, we would always do tea time together. This is us at the Getty doing. Um, their afternoon tea when I was a teenager. And as I grew up, um, I then, you know, after college, I joined eBay, which is up in the Bay Area. And I had a really exciting career in marketing and market research. It was around this time that I was, I was actually starting to make loose leaf tea at my work desk because I was, you know, an avid tea drinker. And I realized that there's so many steps to making tea. You know, you need a kettle, you need a strainer, you need a teacup, you need to prepare your tea and steep it for five to seven minutes. By the time you prepare it, you have to run to your next meeting. And so this is my constant frustration when I was working. And so that's really what set me off to go experiment with tea in my kitchen and just play around with loose leaf tea, learn the properties of it, 
and see if I could make an easier way just for myself to um, enjoy loose leaf tea while on the go or, or prepared in a more convenient fashion. And that's when I discovered um, and created this product called Tea Drops. So it's exceptional loose leaf tea without the tea bag. It's a shape that has um, all the loose leaf tea finely ground and with spices, sugar compressed together in a fun whimsical shape, heart star and flower. So it's less waste than a tea bag. Um, it's free of microplastics that are in traditional tea bags. Um, and I actually went and applied for a patent on it. So we now own a, own a utility patent on the process of how it's made, the manufacturing process. But that's not how it started. It started out in these little booths. Um, when I, on my side, like on my weekends at eBay, I would post, I had like other business, art, like more artisanal business ideas. I had this tea and cookies booth concept where um, I would bake freshly made cookies on the spot. And while people waited for that, I would serve them tea. And then one day on the right-hand side, I was invited to do a show to make these, tea, these, these you know, freshly baked cookies on the spot. And I looked at the temperature and it was gonna be nearly 98 degrees. And my first thought was like, no one's gonna want these freshly baked cookies on the spot uh, or you know, in such a hot day. And in the meantime, I was making these prototypes of tea drops um, at home. And I decided that, you know, well, I may not be able to sell the cookies, but maybe I could introduce this concept of tea drops and, and try to sell it at this, it was literally a neighborhood artisan show. And that is when, um, that's my friend, Caitlin, we sold out entirely of, of the tea drops. And I didn't even have packaging at that time. I had plastic bags that I was like, but like Ziploc bags that I was filling the tea drops in and selling it. And so that, that moment, that show was the first time I really considered tea drops being like a business because at that point it was just a hobby. And this moment of selling out of it, it was only 50 or 60 of drops. You could see them on the trays was that turning point for me. And so I started doing a ton of shows. I would go on campus. I would do any artisan shows I could come across um, and I would, I would just serve my tea. I would have a little booth with um, a very humble booth with just samples and whoever would come and visit, I would just hand them a cup of tea drops, um, sell my boxes, those artisan boxes. My brother, he was a UX designer at Google at the time. So he helped me design my logo, my first logo. And I got these made. Um, I designed the box kind of functionality, but really just, you know, um, a very, very, humble beginning of just wanting to share this experience with others. And I did that for years. Um, and my mom flew up to the Bay Area at the time and would help me in my kitchen because I started growing, growing this business. I first got this uh, license to make the product in my kitchen and she would come up and we would work 16 hour days just producing this in my kitchen. And then eventually moved to a commercial kitchen where we were making the product at scale. Um, and this was it. This was like a family affair. That's my brother um, up on the top, well, center, center upward, you know, helping me at my artisan shows, my mom in the kitchen. Um, I had some interns on the right hand side. This is us in the early days, just like making tea drops around the clock and going to these shows. And eventually it paid off. You know, we started getting picked up at Nordstrom, Anthropology, um, bigger retailers and um, got to sell on Home Shopping Network a ton of times sharing the product. Then, you know, celebrity influencers started to, to, to um, gain notice of tea drops and um, Chrissy Teigen in particular, I remember one day tweeted about us and that just completely shifted, you know. I mean, I, I think the course of the business, you have certain key milestones where you're like, okay, that's gonna be transformational. And um, that was definitely a transformational day. And she just like unsolicitedly um, had great things to say about our product. And then over time, we've gained the adoration of a lot of amazing women that we admire from Oprah, Tori Burch to even Michelle Obama um, and receiving a note from her just, you know, that she's tried the tea drops and she enjoys it. Obviously these are just pinch me moments that you don't expect in your entrepreneurial journey. The other part of tea drops that is very dear to us is 
our relationship with Thirst Project. Um, and as Jenny mentioned, with every box of tea we sell, we donate what's equivalent to of a year's supply of clean water through our um, partner, Thirst Project. So I just wanted to share a little bit more about that partnership and initiative. If it will play. Which it may not play. So let me go ahead and um, give me a second. I'm going to pull up the video. Almost there. All right, can you guys see this? Great. And I'm founder and CEO of Tea Drops. When you drink Tea Drops, you're not just drinking tea, but you're joining like-minded individuals that care about the values that Tea Drops stand for. We're really proud at Tea Drops to partner with a nonprofit called Thirst Project, and they focus on youth education around the water crisis and build water walls around the world. Without access to clean water, you can't solve the fundamentals of life, but you also can enjoy something as simple as a cup of tea. With every box of tea we sell, we donate what's equivalent to a year supply of clean water. So we're really making an impact where it matters. And we're just thankful to our community for helping us along the way. Yeah. So really pretty out product to drops. We built um, about four to five water wells right now. Um, and, and this year we're actually expanding our partnership with Thirst Project will be, um, they have this thing called Youth Legacy Scholarships where, um, you know, they're really training youth uh, and that's middle school to high school age students um, to really join the water crisis movement to help fund and um, fundraise for their own water well builds. And so we'll be giving 15 scholarships out this year um, with that particular project. So our relationship with those project just deepens and deepens every year. Um, so this is some of our team to date, you know, we have um, two different warehouses we work out of in the country, um, three different manufacturing arms across the country so that we can ship, um, you know, all over, <laughs> all over the country and even internationally. Um, we are a very woman forward company, but, you know, we also have um, a lot of diversity on the team, whether that's male, female, um, um, you know, just like a, a great ethnic diversity as well on the team. And so I think that's something that we're really proud of and also reflected in our um, investors as well. So things I've learned along the way, this is, I actually prepared this for something else, but I felt it was useful here. And you can kind of see from my journey that this wasn't all built overnight. You know, I started this five and a half, six years ago, really out of my apartment, kitchen and garage. And you can see just how small that operation was and it took time to cultivate um, patience and, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of people around me that supported my, my dream to do this. And I think one thing that I I've learned to embrace in all of this is, is my personal story in all of this. You can see how connected and tied my dad's story, my mom's story, my cultural upbringing is to why I even decided to start this company and start tea drops. And I think if we dig deep within each one of us, we all have a personal story that we can bring to the table, whether it's an entrepreneurship, it's in our everyday job, um, or even in school that makes us really unique and different from others, you know? And so I think um, it was something that I wasn't always aware of, but as soon as I started embracing that story more um, and also learning more about that journey and that personal story um, is when it really unlocked a lot of, a lot of potential for me and my business. And the last thing I would say is that, you know, a lot of this, we've had so many ups and downs in building this business, um, you know, from starting it to raising capital 
to even this year, there's a ton of supply chain, global supply chain meltdowns happening. Um, but in all of it, you know, it, it really is about persistence. And I know that sounds cliche, but it's a decision to just keep moving forward each and every day, even when you don't feel like it, even when things are really, really challenging. Um, but my favorite Rumi quote is, as you walk, the way appears. And I found that to be really true with this business that, you know, I don't come from a chemistry background. I've never started a business before. I've never raised capital before. Um, these are a lot of firsts for me. I've never developed a product before. I've never, you know, sold into Whole Foods or sold into Costco or sold into all any of these retailers or, you know, um, I'm not a media personality. So to be on HSN four or five times, you know, it's not my natural environment to sell live on TV. But with anything, you know, these are all skills you can learn if there's a willingness um, and if you're persistent about it. And so that's something that I've definitely have carried and learned from this business that um, you're really limited by your, just your own mental constraints and your own beliefs about what you're capable of. So with that, that concludes what I had prepared. We can move into Q&A. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing, Sashi. We really appreciate it. And it's awesome to hear how your background and upbringing and your family's lineage, lineage like dovetails so beautifully with your story. So yeah. thanks, thanks for sharing. Uh, I just want to remind everyone, we're going to use the remaining time for Q&A. So if you have any questions, I know I personally have quite a few, uh, feel free to enter it into the chat and we will get to it um, as soon as we can. So one of the questions that I have for you, Sashi, you know, and I think this is relevant with this audience, I would say maybe a third of them are working on launching their own companies right now. Um, and as you know, starting a business can be really daunting. Like, where do you begin? There's a thousand first steps that you can take. Take. So how did you figure out what to do first with tea drops? Um, I don't think I really knew. I just think you kind of go down each path and then you're like, okay, that's not working. Um, and then you try another one. I think what really helps though, is having a peer group to, to, um, connect with and to learn from, I found insane value from just other founders or other people trying to do a similar thing in a different category or industry that, um, and people are so generous with their time and generous with their knowledge. So I would say to just find a peer network early on so you can um, educate and learn from each other. So true. I think just getting out there too, building up the courage to share your idea and get feedback yeah. is, is really critical uh, in yeah. that process. Yeah. So you mentioned not having a background in chemistry, not knowing much about manufacturing and, and all these different facets, facets that are so important in your business. Can you share like what were some of those major challenges in the beginning? Um, and how did you navigate them? How do you overcome them? Yeah, I mean, I think there's so many different things that are challenging. I'm like, where do we begin? Um, I think so much of it is like, you don't have knowledge about an industry. You know, you don't, I like, I've never been in the food and beverage industry. So just learning the ropes of what that entails, how to go about approaching a, a retailer like a Whole Foods and getting your product in, there's such a huge learning curve there. Um, and the other thing is just around scaling in your manufacturing. You know, I didn't really know after I moved from my kitchen, moving to a commercial kitchen where you're, it's basically sharing your kitchen, like a larger kitchen space with other brands and then moving that to a manufacturer to make your product. That was really, really hard to get someone to take a chance on making your product. And it's very different. It's a very different format than any other tea and really any other product on the market. So having someone take that chance on it um, I had to talk to 20 plus people, you know, different manufacturers before I got a yes. So I think that there's just a ton of hurdles, like operational hurdles, um, financing hurdles, trying to figure out like, okay, after I bootstrapped, where am I going to find other funding? How does that work? And you're learning a completely new skill set while you're still running your business. So, um, that to me, 
are some of the initial challenges. So building off of that, we've got quite a few questions coming in. Brianna wants to know, was there ever a point you thought about giving up for any reason? And if so, what did you do in order to push through that? No, like, I don't think so. Um, I mean, there's definitely hard points where you're like, I don't know if I'll be in business next week because there's been many times, especially early on when we were just like one check away from missing payroll or not being able to, um, to <laughs> like sustain the business financially. And so, um, you know, that's, that was like very stressful, but in terms of my will, I've never ever doubted that or not wanting to do, not wanting to do this. In fact, I do think that's probably also um, part of it, right? Is that I remember there being a time, I think around the same time when I wasn't sure if we were going to make payroll the next week and we were, you know, we were late on receiving some payments for some of the invoices we've already sent product for. And I thought to myself, like, just in my head, and this just shows you the level of craziness. I'm like, okay, well, if I can't, you know, if, if like, it's going to be hard financially this, this month, well, maybe I can like give up my apartment and I can move into my office. I can sleep there. I'll like sleep underneath my desk and I can shower at the YMCA if I need to. Um, and I can make it work these next couple months. But I think, you know, even that thought process process is how much I wanted it that like, I was totally fine giving up an apartment, giving up any form of comfort or luxury because I wanted this so bad. Um, and I think that's also something that's um, definitely carried me through because it's it's one of those things where there's so many reasons why you 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 can give up or should give up. Um, everything's hard. It's really hard. And so I think that there just has to be a will and you have to want it enough to keep going. Well, and it sounds like you have this confidence that even if you don't know what to do, you'll figure it out. And I think there's some of that. I think there's like, there's, it's, you know, it's a double-edged sword because I think that I have strong confidence in some areas, but just like everyone else, I'm like, I don't know if this is going to work out. I don't know how we're going to do this. And um, it can be really worry, worrying. And, um, you know, this is something where you build your confidence day in and day out by just doing things. It's not something that you initially just have, but you also have faith. Like, like I said, if you walk, something will appear, whether that's a, dis, that's a, you know, uh, enlightenment on what, what to do as well as what not to do. So I feel like that's, that's the level of confidence I have that like, all right, just like moving forward and doing something will produce some kind of result. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Mm -hmm. So Jesse wants to know, what's your best piece of advice for students wanting to create a startup company? I'd say, I think it's really important that you guys work at startups too, initially. Um, and also, you know, I also encourage working at larger corporations as well. I don't know if you can fully appreciate, not that you can't, but it's, it's harder to appreciate entrepreneurship or a startup um, as much until you've been you've worked at a larger corporation or maybe you've worked at a startup and you've seen things you loved and you also see things that are maybe inefficient or things you want to change. Um, so I do encourage getting that experience, even if it's not at your own company, um, of, you know, arming up and, and getting that experience however you can early on. So you have a better idea of what you want and don't want in a work, in a, in work culture and also at a company. Um, and the second thing is that I think that there's this, um, desire for overnight success, instantaneous success. Um, you know, we all want that. We all want to like start a Shopify website and just, you know, have a ton of orders come in and be swamped with orders. Um, I can tell you when I launched my website, no one purchased the first day. And the second purchase I had was like a family member, you know, the next day it was like crickets. And so I think that's, you know, you, you shouldn't have this mentality, like build it and they will come. You should actually err on the side of like, it's going to be really, really hard to get people to my website. And what can I be doing? How can I proactively be reaching out and socializing this um, ahead of time? And, and not to be discouraged if that's, if, if also that, that happens to you, you know, that you build something, 
people don't really get it or understand it right away. I can tell you stories and stories about how people thought that, you know, when I would pitch my product to them or pitch it as to get investment or even in retail, they would call my product tea drops gimmicky or that like it was a novelty item um, or that it was a gift item that they didn't really see being an everyday consumable. So there will be a lot of opinions about it and um, that, yeah, that also, you know, that's that people, you know, we have this idea that people will understand what we're doing right away. And that just is usually not the case. And to kind of piggyback, one of the points that you broke, you brought up, you know, you launched the website, learned that if you build it, they don't come, you know, right away. You have to have some sort of strategy in place. Um, me asked a question, would you mind sharing your experience on marketing and, and running digital advertising? Um, yeah, and that it's very hard. <laughs> it's a very hard time to be running um, digital ads right now. I don't know if you guys are privy to all the different changes having, happening on Facebook with the iOS um, 14 changes earlier this year, and then just cost of advertising getting more and more expensive. So I think that's where true marketing um, kind of skill sets come in, is that the things that worked last year, or the year before on on digital marketing, whether that's Facebook, IG, um, don't work anymore. There's a different playbook. And you always also have to keep your mind sharp on emerging channels, whether that's TikTok, even Pinterest we utilize for advertising now, um, that you always have to be in, in a curious mindset to try more, learn more when it comes to marketing. So I think that's also been super helpful to us is that we don't just be complacent being on a couple channels that we're always learning more about influencers, affiliate marketing, um, and rounding out the, our sources of traffic. Okay. So I want to shift gears a little bit. I mean, you've got this amazing company and brand, um, you know, your product is inherently, um, making a better environmental impact than most of the competitors out there. You've also got the social component where you're funding clean water for people in need. And I'm just curious, how has um, your drive to make a social and, and environmental impact, how have you stayed true to it through all of the challenges, right? Like when you have those moments where you're trying to make payroll, but you're also funding these initiatives and paying a premium to have fair trade in your business and you know, use less packaging. How do you balance all of, all of those initiatives? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a process. You know, we didn't start with Thirst Project right away. Thirst Project was introduced a couple of years into the business. And, um, and so it's not that I was trying to start a company while also build a social initiative right away. Um, but I also found the things that are really important to a consumer um, are naturally important to how I want to build a company. And I knew that just based on my knowledge of, of T estates that organic is really um, table stakes for me because of the manufacturing process that's involved um, and the pesticides used if something is non-organic and the harvesting practices, practices if it's non-organic. So to me, certain decisions were table stakes. Um, being organic, and then the next frontier, which we didn't get that certification until a couple of years later, but I always knew it was important, was fair trade. Um, that's because also I knew in the T estates that there's a huge disparity um, in T estate uh, work, like worker composition. So, you know, 70% of T estate workers, maybe more, are female, um, yet they're paid 30% less than their male counterparts. And so you really start to realize, like, wow, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of problems, right, in, in the tea industry. And I can't solve all of them, but I can at least tackle this one area in my small way, which is um, getting fair trade certified because I know that that means that tea estate workers, regardless of their gender, are paid a fair and equitable wage. And that's something that I can educate mm -hmm. our consumers about, about why that's our decision and why we think it's important. And those customers who align with those values, which seem to be, you know, many really care, start to care about that initiative and are willing to pay a premium because of that. 
So I think to answer your question, it's kind of twofold where one, you're not doing everything all at once and trying to solve a water crisis, trying to solve um, organic harvesting, trying to solve for the, the wage gap on in, in this industry, but you're tackling one thing at a time and you're educating your consumer along the way so that they understand why you're making certain decisions. Um, and the last piece of, you know, packaging, we reduced our packaging greatly, but we're not perfect. In fact, the next frontier for us is we get a lot of complaints around our, um, our, sorry, call, um, our single serve packaging, that this is recyclable, um, but not plant-based. And so this is actually, my team just sent me these prototypes because this is actually our new um, plant-based compostable packaging that's launched. You guys are seeing the first look um, that's launching in Q1 of next year. So, you know, we, we knew we could solve for some things in the packaging sustain sustainability front. We couldn't solve for everything all at once, but we're slowly, slowly making those changes um, and steps forward. So this will be the last frontier of really making our product fully sustainable. Awesome. And congrats on that big <laughs> step. That's great. It's good to see. Um, so Mary had a question what that may, you know, align nicely with the last one is what is your favorite memory with launching and running your business thus far or one of your favorite memories? Yeah, you know, it's every time this time of year um, because I started my business like the first real holiday I think was December two, or like the holiday season of 2015. And so this time of year, it like, it's weird. I have these moments of nostalgia for that moment in time when my mom and I were working in my kitchen, my upstairs kitchen, 16 hour days. And then we would take the tea, we would make, bring it down to my converted garage workshop and individually wrap. We didn't have this type of wrapping. We had like cellophane wrapping. We would put the tea drop in, wrap it while we listened to music or chatted, caught up on life. And I had, you know, friends and interns who would come over, friends because we had so many orders that my friends would come and pitch in and like help with the production and fulfillment process. And those in hindsight are some of the best memories um, because you're early enough in your business where everything's exciting and everyone's getting involved and you're like, whoa, I can't believe we just got this order from Nordstrom or, you know, this retailer. And we're all like in this, it's just like a ex very exciting time. And the fact that I could get my mom involved in the early days of my business and friends and like even friends, you know, or interns I, that are still at this company now um, who were present five years ago, six years ago, it's like, it's a really special time. And I'll never get that moment back, you know? So I feel, especially during this time when it starts to get busy in the business and just like five years ago when that, that starts to happen during October, November, December for us, like there's a certain feeling of nostalgia I get about it. It's so awesome though, to hear about your beginning, you know, starting with family and just in the kitchen, like any of us could be in your shoes at that point. And it's yeah. so inspiring to see like that was your starting point and here yes. you are now. Yeah. So it's like, you never, yeah, you're like, I'll never get that opportunity to just like make something small in my kitchen. I remember at the time we would hand wrap every box of tea we would use um what is that like that uh brown construction paper and then tie it with a bow and have a wax seal on every order that's like the the level of detail of care we went through with every box obviously now that's not scalable and we, and we don't do that but like those are my memories from the early days which really were um important on creating a great customer experience and um yeah so it's just it's 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 uh, very, very like warm memories for me. And that's awesome. So at that point, did you have any idea what lie ahead for you um, in terms of, you know, going on to raise millions in funding, expand your retail footprint to thousands of store locations? Like it, was any of that on your mind at that point? No, like I knew that this was changing the course of my life in a sense, starting this and like everything I would learn from it. But I mean, I just, I thought like making a million dollars in revenue a year was like the dream and the end all be all. Like that's all I really envisioned for it. Um, 
So yeah, it's, it's a, it's a very, uh, it's like, I don't know what the word is. I'm missing it. It's on the tip of my tongue, but it's like, it's very unexpected mm -hmm. what's happened. And so Nicole had a question. She's curious how you even went about raising capital. What did that process look at? What point did you know that was a necessary next step for you? And how did you navigate it? Well, it took about a year and a half to really get comfortable with the idea of taking capital in. And also like, I didn't even know what angel investing was or VC funding. Like I remember when someone said VC funding, I had to Google it. I didn't like understand it. Um, so it took me a year and a half to get comfortable with the idea of taking someone else's money and like being a steward of it and needing to produce like a return. So the first year and a half, but just me building confidence that I actually had a business, a big enough business that warranted taking on capital. And then the next phase was really just being educated. Like what is VC funding? What's an, what's an angel investment? What's the difference between a convertible note and an equity raise? And I read this book called Venture Deals by Brad Feld which if you guys are interested in just learning like what are the different financing instruments? How does one raise money? That's a great starting place for you. Um, so I really, I remember reading that book and then just talking to a lot of friends, a lot of people who I had heard had raised money and just picked their brain. Um, it's a very scary thing to do because you're like, how does this work? How do you determine the valuation of your company? When you get a term sheet, like how do you know if it's a good deal? Um, and the other part of that's really, really hard is actually getting the investment. It took me 80 to 100 conversations, my first raise, to really even find people interested um, to, to invest. And so I think that was, um, it's demoralizing, you know, it really is, like, especially when you really see the potential of something. And like I said earlier, people come back and they're like, well, it's kind of like a gimmicky product. I could see it doing well this season, but... I don't think like you can really scale with this and that being the narrative over and over again. So um, I think learning to handle rejection is very important early on in life, um, whether that be in relationships or whether that be in getting investment or in business. And I think part of it, people don't share with you, but I think it's important that you not take anything personally. Um, you know, I've had investors who said no early on because they didn't really understand it and come back for your four years later and be like, whoa, um, you know, can we put in a check now? And um, to not hold a grudge and also I'll take it personally when people, if people don't see the opportunity in things. I mean, you think about like things we use every day now um, that we would have never thought would be as big as they are, whether it's, you know, Peloton or even Netflix at the time when they first started, it's like you, you can't see the vision of something until you can, right? And everyone's journey of seeing that is different. So it's really important just to find the people who can see that vision and you can paint that vision too early on um, and be okay with the rejection or overall feedback you get. Um, so that's a long-winded answer, but hopefully that shares oh, that. Very insightful. Yeah. Um, so receiving 80 to 100 no's, I mean, like you said, I'm sure that did feel demoralizing. But what do you think was happening in the background that eventually got you to that yes? I think it was two things. I think it was building my own confidence in my business. And even though I would hear these no's, I was like, yeah, but it doesn't really make sense to me. You know, T is this... Um, I think globally, it's a $64 billion category, second to water, tea's the most consumed beverage in the world. So when I would get feedback, like this is a niche category or the tea industry is saturated, you know, who are you to come in and like disrupt it? It didn't compute in my head. I'm like, I could understand the feedback people were saying. And I think I, like, I hopefully took it um, with, with, you know, some level of graciousness, but I also knew that this was, this was a huge opportunity and that I was solving a real problem. As an avid tea drinker, I knew I was solving a real problem. And so I think conviction in that, but also improving my ability to tell that story. And I had to go through a lot of training, a lot of no's, a lot of refinements to my pitch 
um, to finally have the tools and have the language to early on with an investor within the first five minutes convey this opportunity, my story and why I was the one to, um, to, to kind of steward this innovation and, and steward the business. Okay, good to know. So you talk about the early days with your family in the kitchen and friends helping you at different events. How did you take the leap from that to building your team? And is your family part of the team? No, they're not. Uh, <laughs> for probably good reason, we'd probably kill each other. Um, <laughs> but I think um, building a team is one of the hardest things. Like harder than raising money, harder than all everything. Like it's, it's very challenging. And I think, um, it takes a lot of like failing to, to, um, kind of get better. Um, so I think that's been definitely the hardest part. I've been very lucky where I've, I don't know, somehow through, um, pure luck, and I don't, I don't know how, but I've attracted some great people along the way, very loyal and kind and, um, and great, just overall amazing performers. But I would say that it's, it's, it's a very different skill set, and you, um, and one that I think takes practice. You can get advice, but it's just like, I can describe to you what an orange tastes like, but you kind of have to experience it for yourself to really know, um, to really know the taste, right? So. Mm -hmm. So Mary had a question. She's wondering, what would you say to someone who is afraid to grow their team? Um, well, I was afraid for a long time too. I think the best analogy I found is this other entrepreneur who early on told me that um, hiring is scary because you think like, oh, they're going to be here forever. And now I'm responsible for another person. I have to pay their, you know, obviously, um, be able to pay their salary and do I even have enough business to sustain that? And also like, what if they're not the right fit on the line? Or what if, what if I really like them and they leave me, you know, all of these different questions you have. Um, but this entrepreneur told me, he's like, you know, Sashi, building a team is like a great party bus. And, you know, imagine it's your party, you get this, you hire this great party bus, everyone gets on, it's like a rock in time, you have drinks, you're partying, it's great. Um, you stop at your first destination and some people get off because they really want to go to that club, um, but you want to continue going. And so you keep going, uh, new people come on the party bus, it's an awesome time. It's a different time than the first round of partying, but it's like still a great time and you keep going. And then the next destination, other people get off the bus, but then new people come on and you keep going a different type of party, but um, but still fun. And you have to be, and basically the idea is you have to be grateful for everyone who's come on your bus to make it the party it is because without their presence, without their contribution, it wouldn't have been that party. Now it's a different party now, but you also have to be grateful that there were other people who came on board who made it that version of the party. So I, I really like, I didn't understand what he was saying when he first told me this, but then now I'm growing a team. I'm like, he's so right. This is like the endless party and people come on and get off at different points. Sometimes you have to pick, like kick someone off because they're just too inebriated and they're ruining the party <laughs> and you just got to keep going. But that is like the best analogy of building a team that I can muster. Oh, what a great analogy to like reframe yeah. your mindset. That's awesome. Yeah. Things and, and I think the attitude of like really being grateful for the people mm -hmm. who have come on, who've had to depart, like is very important because I think at the moment at that time, you can be like, but why are they going? What, you know, like, or really upset that you've had to let them go or whatever, but you also have to realize like, wow, I got to, from point A to point B with them. And that's really special. And I'm really grateful for that. Awesome. Well, that's good to hear. Um, to Evan was asking about the book that you mentioned. It was Venture Deals by It's Brad. called Venture Deals by Brad Feld. And I think he has another co-author, but I'm forgetting the name. Okay. So that answers Evan's questions. And then Francis has another question piggybacking the book one. What are some of your other favorite books um, for helping you succeed in business? 
Oh, man, I wish I had time to read books, but I don't have that time and time anymore. Um, what about audio? Have, yeah, I love uh, obviously different podcasts. When I can, I listen to how I built this. Um, I also think that a great article is this HBS article about uh, managing your energy, not your time, because um, I find that really true, right? We all have like a certain um, set amount of energy per day. And for some of us, that is early in the morning, early in the evening when we feel most alive, but you really have to manage your energy so that you're doing the, the kind of um, most important, most impactful work when you really have that level of alertness. And for me, that tends to be in the morning um, before I take on meetings or um, for the rest of the day. So I try to like maybe book meetings later and really preserve my morning time for like productive, impactful work. And so I thought that was a good reframe of managing time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Dan had a question going back to your bus analogy. Any advice on how to deliver the news if you're kicking someone off the bus? That's a hard one, Dan. I don't feel like I'm the best at it. <laughs> um, but I do think just like being open and honest about it is honestly the best policy. Um, sometimes for HR reasons, you cannot kind of provide that level of transparency and sometimes saying less is more. Unfortunately, we are in a very litigious society and, you know, this is something like a lot of people just won't say, but it's just true. Um, so sometimes you kind of just have to, um, let HR take the lead or, or, you know, be very short and sweet with your dismissal. Um, and so I don't think there's a one size fits all. I think it's very dependent on what the situation with is with that, um, employee, if they really have tried to improve, if they've, you know, um, if there's been effort or, or, you know, if it's someone that's kind of more belligerent and so every case is different. So I don't know, um, in your situation, if you have a specific, um, situation you're dealing with or whatnot, but I think that's kind of what I've learned is sometimes saying less is more. Got it. Well, thank you. So we're nearing the end of the event. We probably have time for one or two more questions. Um, one that I wanted to ask myself is what are you looking forward to most in your business right now? Um, well, right now we have a very exciting launch happening um, on November 2nd. So I guess that's all I can really say. You can so look we at need to stay tuned. Instagram today on, I'm sure you guys will get the hint when you see our teaser um, today, but it's a collaboration that I'm very excited about. It brings back all my nostalgic 90s memories as a young girl. So I'm excited about it. Um, and then I think there's, a, there's like a lot of launches and just a lot, I, I mean, I'll chalk it up to, you know, we want to really build a memorable, um, experiential brand. So, you know, using tea as a means of experiential self-care, um, a community, building a community on top of it. And I slowly see that really coming into fruition by products we're creating, the online community we're, we're creating, and the connection that we have to our customers. And so I, I know that sounds cliche, but it's something that I've always dreamed of having like a tea community mm -hmm. um, since I was little. And I get to like basically create one in real life and like for a living. And so that to me is pretty special. And um, as our reach grows, like we're continuing to grow and foster that community. So that's the most exciting part for me. Awesome. Well, we're excited to see what un unrolls or un is unveiled on, you said November 2nd? November 2nd. All right. Uh, Although, like, uh, I should say October 18th, you'll like know what it is. Okay. Um, our pre-launch, yeah. Got it. Uh, Tyler wants to know, is the ultimate tea sampler box the best starting point if we're interested in tea drops? Yes, I would say that's probably the best one to start with to try our, um, most of our varieties. Sounds like a great gift idea too, yes. with the holiday season coming. Uh, okay, well, that wraps up our question, Sashi. I just want to thank you so much for sharing your story, for being so candid about your journey, sharing, you know, 
the deeper parts of your business with us. It really means a lot. And it certainly yeah. sheds light on, there's so much more to launching a company than just like an income statement or, you know, the more, I guess, mundane things that we can think about when it comes to business. Yeah. Um, definitely. I appreciate the time with you guys. Thanks so much for inviting me, Jenny. Yeah, absolutely. So I just want to thank everyone else for showing up today, for being a part of this great discussion and for contributing your questions. And I want to welcome you to join us again for the last speaker we are hosting on Friday, November 5th. We'll be having a conversation with Andy Ballister, who is the co-founder of GoFundMe. So if you're interested, you can go to our website and sign up just like you did today for Sashi's talk. Um, and I wish you all a wonderful Friday and weekend ahead. And we will be sharing this talk on our website in case anyone wants to come back and reference it. So thank awesome. you, Sashi. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Take care.